Welcome everyone, my name is David Mello, and today we'll be talking about testing software using decision tables. In today's lesson, we'll be covering why you should use decision tables, when to use decision tables, and we'll have a walkthrough creating a decision table against an example business requirement. You can scan this QR code here on the left for an article covering more about the why and the when to use decision tables. So why use decision tables? Well, through the act of creating one, it actually ends up testing the business requirements by fleshing out all the use cases, both implicit and explicit. It creates a blueprint for your engineers to code against. It creates one-to-one -one test cases that are known before coding begins, preventing rework later. It helps to prevent missed test cases and make informed decisions on what not to cover. It creates an artifact that can be used as documentation about how the feature should work in the future and serve as an oracle for test cases. And lastly, it's a way to visibly show stakeholders how many tests are needed and how many are left while the story is still in the testing phase. Decision tables can be very useful depending on what kind of feature you're testing. Decision tables are useful when testing features with complex business logic or rules, when testing features where outputs are based on several input combinations, or when testing features with multiple dependent inputs accepting a range of values against business logic. So let's take an example business requirement. Let's pretend for a moment that Regressive Insurance Company needs you to test their home insurance policy decision engine. It considers several aspects of the applicant and their property to determine eligibility rates and discounts. They're expanding coverage into U.S. Postal Zip Codes 33301 and 33302 only. If the age of the roof is over 40 years old, they're ineligible for coverage unless they are in Zip Code 33302, where this is waived. If they have one car insured through Regressive, they will receive a single discount or multi-car discount if two or more are insured through Regressive. If they have had one or more claims on this address in the previous five years, a surcharge will be applied, but will be ineligible for a policy if claims are greater than or equal to five in the past five years. So now that we have an interestingly complex business requirement, let's turn it into a decision table. So I tend to find that decision tables kind of lend themselves well to spreadsheets. So here in front of us, I have Excel with some things already sort of filled out to move things along here. Um, what I tend to do is uh, create several columns. The first one is going to hold our conditions. The next one is going to hold the values for those conditions. And then these remaining columns are going to be the combinatorial inputs that we're going to use for our test cases. So we're going to go into that a little bit more in a moment. And down in the lower half of the decision table, we're going to have our effects labeled. So here we have four captured from this business requirement. And the first one is whether or not they're eligible for a policy if they should be uh, eligible for a single car or multi-car discount, and if they have any recent claim surcharges um, based on the requirements. So this business requirement for the Regressive Insurance Company's decision engine has these four conditions. One is gonna be for recent claims, the other is zip codes, the other is uh, cars insured, and lastly, the roof age. Now that we've listed our conditions, we need to pick good input values for these conditions from our requirements. So let's uh, take, for example, zip codes. Let's look down here in the requirement and find that they're expanding into US Postal Zip Codes 33301 and 33302 only. So we should do some boundary value analysis here to uh, find some values both in and outside of the set to test both positive and negative uh, test cases here. So let's list zip codes 33300, which is outside of the set, 33301, which is inside, 33302, which is inside, and 33303, which is outside. All right, so now that we have the zip codes covered, let me skip to the next tab where I filled in some of the other values. So for recent claims, if we look down here, we can see that if they've had one or more claims on this address in the previous five years, a surcharge will be applied, but they will be ineligible for a policy if claims are greater than or equal to five in the past five years. All right, so we have boundaries at the values of one and five. And when we're doing boundary value analysis, we wanna go one below and one above the minimum increment for each one of those boundary values. So in the case of whole numbers here, we have one, so I'm gonna cover one under, which is zero, and one above, which is two. And similarly, I'm gonna cheat a little bit and not do four, just to cut down on the number of combinatorial test cases here. But we're gonna definitely do five and six, which is one above. Since we're doing an inequality, I think that's gonna be a good compromise, which is something you may need to do in the real world because you just don't have time to test everything. Um, we've covered zip codes. And then the next one would be cars insured. So if we look down 
under uh, cars insured. This is logic around the multi-car discount or single car discount or, or no discount at all. So um, the minimum is one to qualify for a single car discount and two for a multi-car discount. So again, um, boundary value analysis, this one's a little bit easier since um, uh, we have one and two touching each other. So let's do one less than one, which is zero, which would be uh, no cars insured. And then three, which would be what would happen if you have um, more than uh, more than two cars? Do you have a multi multi car discount or something else? Right. So let's make sure that's covered. Lastly is roof age, which is a qualifying or disqualifying factor in this case. So if the roof um, age is over 40 years old, they're ineligible for coverage unless they are in zip codes 33302, which makes this an interesting requirement. So let's test um, right at 40, which should still be valid. Uh, one below 40, which is 39, and one above 40, which is 41, in which case they should be ineligible. So when you combine all these inputs together against all these conditions, this creates what's called a combinatorial test case explosion. So to figure out the exhaustive number of combinatorial test cases in your requirement, you simply take the uh, number of input values and you multiply them by each other. So for example, down in total rules, I figured out that we have 240 total rules that we would need to test to exhaustively execute all the tests against this specification. And we do that by taking five, which is the number of input values in the first condition, multiplied by four, which is the number in the second, multiplied by four, which is the number of the third, and three, which is the number of values in the third input. So five times four times four times three is 240. So now that we know the total number of test cases, we're gonna express those uh, together as a um, combination of inputs across these columns here. And we're gonna use another formula here to figure out how to list all these values across without skipping any. And if you look to the right of these RV cells, you'll notice some more numbers. And what these express are the number of times to repeat each input value across so that when you list them all out, you eventually have exhausted all the input combinations without skipping anything. And we'll go over that in a second. But to come up with these numbers, you simply go ahead and take the number of values and divide that by the total rules to get your RV1. So in this case, I'm dividing 240 by five, which is the number of input values. So then to get RV2, you divide RV1 by the number of inputs in RV2. So I have four there divided by 48 gives me 12. So we'll just follow that pattern down. So cars insured has four values. So we're gonna divide 12 by four, which gives us three. And lastly, RV4 has three values. So three divided by three is one. So now that we know how many times to repeat our values, we can start filling them out. So essentially what you're gonna do, for example, for recent claims is I have to start off by putting the input value of zero over 48 times. And then I'm gonna do that again for the number one, 48 times, and then the number two, 48 times, the number five, 48 times, and the number six, 48 times, and that's gonna fill me out all the way across. So I'm gonna use the power of editing and go to our next step here, which has these all filled out. So you can see here, we have our zeros repeated all the way across. And starting to fill in the ones, the twos, the fives, the sixes, and so on. And then at the end here, we should have 240 test cases. And then if you look under you'll see that we're gonna go ahead and follow that same pattern. So again, remember um, roof age, which is RV4, you just alternate every cell or every column. So 39, 40, 41, 39, 40, 41, 39, 40, 41. And um, remember on uh, cars insured, which was RV3, you're repeating those every three values. So zero is repeated three times, one's repeated three times, two is repeated three times and so on. So when you combine these all together, you've exhaustively executed all of the combinatorial test case inputs for this requirement. So that's a lot of tests. And you can imagine that if you add, you know, even one more variable and maybe it just has a true and false value, that's doubling the number of test cases and then just going to double it again and double it again. So it's deceptive a lot of times. People don't realize really how many tests a requirement have um, kind of you know, hidden in there. Um, so when you're, you know, business analyst or a product owner is wondering why you're not done testing the requirement, that's what makes decision tables uh, so useful. You can show them really what their requirement means as far as like test coverage, what you need to do to actually cover 
their requirement in full. And you can also show them, you know, really what your progress is. Because if you show them like, okay, listen, this requirement's going to take 240 test cases to uh, fully test. I'm on test number 60 and I've got this many more to go. So you can kind of project you know, when you're going to finish and that sort of thing. And that uh, kind of shows progress to everyone on the team so they know what's going on. But um, this is only half of a test case because you know the inputs, but you haven't mapped out the actual expected outcomes. And this is where the discussion with your business analyst and the testing of the requirement part really comes into play because not all of these combinations may have been thought of. Uh, maybe some are invalid or maybe their business analyst did not consider them when they were originally envisioning the requirement. So this is where um, some of it might be clear and then you can start filling this in on your own. But if you end up on sort of like dead ends, you're testing the requirement at that point and having that um, you know, bi-directional conversation with your stakeholder or your business analyst to talk about how things should really work. For example, if we were to take this uh, first test case here where we have no recent claims, you are in zip code 33300, you have zero cars insured, and your roof age is 39 years old. What should happen here with regard to being eligible for a policy? Well, the requirement said it's only for zip codes 33301 and 33302 only. So they don't get a policy um, and whether or not they have a single car discount or multi-car discount or recent claim surcharge is really not applicable because they don't get a policy um, in this case at all. So that's what you could do to fill that out for that one. Um, and this is gonna be very similar for basically everything in the zip code. So you're gonna have some repetitive test cases here and we're gonna go into whether or not you need to keep them in the next phase. So let's go to a more interesting combination of values. So if we look here on uh, column 18, they have zero recent claims, they are in a valid zip code, and they have one car insured, but they have a older roof, right? So um, they'd, be an eligible, they'd be eligible for a policy because they're in the right zip code, but their roof is uh, too old. So again, no, and they're not applicable, again, um, for any of the other values because they don't have a policy, right? But if we go one to the left, they have zero claims. They're in the correct zip code. They have one car and they have a 40 year old roof, which is just on the edge. So yes, they are eligible. Uh, they get a single car discount and they do not get a multi-car discount because they only have one car. And do they get a recent claim surcharge? No, because they have no recent claims. So again, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit and go over to our next tab, which lists out all the exhaustive combinations of values. And you'll notice that I have some color highlighting on these cells, which helps kind of just uh, make things a little bit more organized for my brain. Um, when I'm coming up with these rules, it kind of highlights things for me. So you can use conditional formatting in something like Excel to kind of help you figure out. So I've got, for example, um, a light green for single car discount or darker green for multi-car discount and that sort of thing. Um, and then red on some of the ones that are uh, kind of exclusionary um, combinations based on uh, eligibility. Um, here's an interesting test case around zip code 33302 where the requirement had a special waiver for that zip code with regard to roof age. So even though it's a 41 year old roof, you still are eligible for a policy in that case because it's in that particular zip code. But if we did that same rule against zip code 33301, they should not be eligible for a policy. But again, We've got, you know, 240 test cases here and um, it might not be, you know, worthy of your time to test all of those. It's the safest thing to do to exhaustively test everything because you don't necessarily know if they're, where the mistake's gonna be inside of the implementation unless you're gonna start doing maybe some white box testing. So if uh, the less you trust the code or the less knowledge you have of the code, uh, the better it is to do exhaustive testing, but that's gonna come at a time cost and time is money, time is expensive. So you could optimize things a little bit here by what's called collapsing some of the columns. So again, I mentioned that we've got, um, you know, a lot of the similar sort of outcomes where things sort of short circuit because maybe they're in an invalid zip code or their roof is too old and things like that. So we don't need to compare um, maybe so many types of equivalence classes. So let's go over to this optimize tab and talk through that a little bit. So you're gonna to wanna to optimize test cases by collapsing columns where variations on invalid inputs would yield the same results, right? We should be able to cut down these 240 test cases significantly. 
So let's walk through that now. All right, so what I'd recommend doing in this case is keeping probably one uh, to cover some of the test cases here where there's just you know um, an equivalence class or something similar. So in the case of uh, an invalid zip code, I wanna keep at least one. So let's keep this first column here uh, in zip code 33300, and I'm going to delete the rest of them. All right. And now in uh, 33301, we do have a lot of interesting test cases that I'm going to keep. I'm going to probably apply similar logic to zip code 33303, where I'm going to take out all these other ones that are all not applicable. It's going to save us a lot of testing. So now in column 49, we're into, um, again, invalid zip codes, and we've varied now from zero to one recent claims. And theoretically, this should not make any difference um, if this was programmed correctly. But to be on the safe side, I'm going to keep one test case just to make sure that there's nothing goofy going on in the code. So I'm going to delete the remainder. I'm going to keep all these valid test cases here in zip codes 33301 and 33302. Going back to 33303, again, we have that uh, upper edge plus one. So again, we're outside of our boundary. So I'm going to delete those, except I'm gonna keep one. So now we vary from zero to one on the recent claims and um, we've already got zero covered on an invalid zip code case and we have one. So I'm not gonna go through and keep any of these on uh, two for recent claims. I feel like that's not gonna matter. And uh, this is a decision that you're gonna to have to make. And um, there's not a right answer or a wrong answer. Um, it's just something that you should talk through with your team and your stakeholders to see whether or not it's uh, worth keeping the tests. It's always better to err on the side of cautioning and keep them. But um, you can always have that conversation on whether or not you should be optimizing. So uh, let's continue on to the right. For the same reason, I'm going to delete these remaining 33303s as we've just varied the number of recent claims. And now uh, we have a, another interesting, more unique case. Now we've got recent claims um, and zip codes both outside of valid parameters. So I'm going to keep one in that zone. As well as I'm going to keep in a case where I am in a valid zip code but have an invalid number of claims. And now this one's going to be the same uh, test case more or less, but it's going to be in a different zip code. So I'm going to keep that one, but I'm going to delete the remainder of the ones in 33302. And now we have um, one outside of the upper boundary on the zip codes uh, with the same sort of pattern as column 145 here. So I'm going to keep that one. And I'm going to make a call to keep this one because it might be an interesting test case. Although, you know, again, if you're really just trying to save time, you might not need this at all. I'm going to delete the remainder here. I'm going to keep one from the um, one more than the max number of claims that you can have, which is six. And basically, I can kill the rest of these test cases. And now this number is not the true number anymore. So let's go ahead and uh, update the number of um, tests that we really have to see the results of our cleanup operation. So now we've taken the test cases from 240 to 83, which is a lot better. And you could probably further optimize down the uh, number of test cases here by collapsing even more. So let me know down in the video description below whether or not you found any other opportunities by looking at the spreadsheet. I'll go ahead and uh, post this somewhere that you can download and play with on your own. Um, if you have any questions or comments or anything I can help with, please let me know in the video description comments as well. And if you found this helpful, please click on the like button, share this video with your friends, and consider subscribing to my channel for more great testing videos. Thanks for watching.